friends. <laughs> Good to be here. The best companies to work for are people-driven. They understand the power of an engaged workforce. They invest in their employees, and they create workplaces where great people want to grow and thrive and contribute their best, regardless of the size of the company. We believe that unprecedented levels of change and disruption require new thinking and transformational approaches to leading and managing people. That's the topic of our presentation today. And so as we get started, of course, a great HR-related disclaimer. Uh, this presentation is for educational purposes only. Trinet provides its clients with legally compliant HR guidance and best practices. Uh, we do not provide legal, tax, or accounting advice. So with that out of the way, before we get started, a little bit uh, about who I am and who Trinet is. Uh, my name is still Casey Devine. I have been in human capital management, which is the space that we cover for eight years. I've been at Trinet since November 2020, so almost uh, two years. Um, did get uh, PHR certified, so I know a little bit about what we're talking about here. Uh, Trinet is uh, one of the leading HR companies. Uh, companies, especially for startups. So we've been around for over 30 years based out of the Bay Area. And what we really do is we empower startups and the organizations that support them and their communities uh, to manage and offload employment risk, find, compete for, and retain top talent, and offer best-in-class HR tech, guidance, and employee benefits. And so let's take a look at our agenda as we get going. First, we'll touch on the trends that are impacting organizations in this changing world. Then we'll look at the four truths about finding and keeping great talent and leave you with some actionable takeaways that you can bring back with you, hopefully including some time for Q&A from our live and virtual audiences at the end. Sound good? Yeah. All right, let's dive in. So as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic changed the world forever and has had multiple implications on the world of work as well. Disruptions that were bubbling up pre-pandemic, like digital transformation, accelerated. And trends that were already in motion, like focusing on personal wellness, gained momentum, thankfully. Here's a look at some of the trends that will have a lasting impact, making HR more dispensable than ever. And when I say that, uh, don't think of HR as something that happens at a, a big organization. It happens where anyone works. And, and so regardless of how big your organization is, this is something that should be absolutely relevant for you today. The first trend is obvious to where we are today actually at Finnovation Labs. It is a flexible and collaborative work environment. It's where we are right now. The pandemic created a reset of how people work. According to a survey of over 17,000 startups and SMBs, our data shows that 80% now expect some or all of their workers to be remote either part-time or full-time. And so when you think about this, a, a lot comes to mind. You might understand Minnesota, but what happens if you now have a remote employee just even over the, the river, or you have someone in Iowa? Are you going to be able to have the, the tools and technology to be able to support that kind of a workforce? And according to recent McKinsey research, more than 25% of job seekers said that they would consider switching employers if they return fully to on-site work. Think about someone saying that even five years ago or 10 years ago, that, that, that shift has been quite dramatic. Founders and leaders had to pivot to find ways to connect and empower their people. The workplace has humanized, so is the world, thankfully. The unrest and awareness uh, triggered by movements like Black Lives Matter, as an example, has ushered in an urgent need to change for the better, to foster inclusion, equity, and belonging in organizations and the communities around them. This, too, is backed by data. Glassdoor found that two-thirds of job seekers demand a diverse workforce when considering employment. So if it isn't obvious through the hiring process or the, the presence online, they're not even considering those, those as options in an already competitive environment. 
So the market is demanding it. Furthermore, employers are increasingly in prioritizing employee well-being. Again, very good thing. I, I think all, since all of us are people, well-being, great, right? When COVID-19 took hold, the crisis cast a new light on that importance of well-being uh, and made organizations acutely aware of the consequences of putting well-being at risk. It's not just the right thing to do as humans. It also makes business sense to do this. When well-being suffers, so does the bottom line. According to Gallup, again, a very reputable source, over $322 billion has been lost due to turnover and lost productivity from burnout. That's it. So I don't know about you all, but I, I can definitely say even getting a sli tiny slice of that pie back into the bottom line would be helpful, even if you are completely a miser and you don't care about people. Just that dollar would make a difference. So this is a good idea to potentially listen to even from the beginnings of your startup. To help mitigate this risk, founders and leaders need to encourage mental wellness, managing work expectations, and prioritizing a healthy work-life balance. All of this has led our labor market to a boiling point right now. The statistics around the phenomenon that experts have coined the great resignation are daunting. According to a Microsoft study, 41% of workers are considering quitting or changing jobs this year. I'm gonna say that again. 41% of workers are thinking of quitting or changing jobs this year. And so if you're someone who even is pre-employment, like you, you aren't even at the point where you're hiring people, this presents an interesting opportunity for you. And per I4CP research, 65% of employers anticipate at least moderate moderate continued talent exodus across any size of employer. So the wheels are absolutely in motion and there's really no holding it back. While these trends may seem extremely challenging to navigate, and they are daunting, I will give you that, they also can serve as a catalyst to create meaningful long-term change in both the employee and the employer experience. So you're probably wondering, where do you start? Let's start with the first truth. In an analysis of 2,000 tasks, 800 jobs, and nine countries, pretty big study, McKinsey reported that hybrid models of work for some employees are absolutely here to stay permanently. And we are in a whole new paradigm going beyond the traditional brick and mortar, clock in, go to your desk, sit there, be productive, or else, then go home approach to working. Like that, that's absolutely gone. And it's causing founders and leaders to grapple with new ideas about how, when, where work gets done. So let's look at some of the stats that tell that story. According to an article in smallbizgenus.com, .net actually, on the ultimate list of remote work statistics, People want the flexibility to work from anywhere. Does that mean a mandate to work from anywhere? No, they want the flexibility to do it. The number of people globally who work from home has raised 150% since 2005. That is wild exponential growth and it's very clearly not slowing down. And by 2028, 73% of all departments in every organization will have at least some remote employees. 40% of people feel the greatest benefit of re remote work is flexible working schedules. That's why they're doing it. 76% of workers would be more willing to stay with their current employer if they could just work flexible hours. And finally, Owl Labs found that companies allowing remote work have 25% less turnover than those who don't. So very clearly, if you are a startup if you're a founder or you're at a larger organization, this is an easy lever to pull to at least hedge the bet against some of those daunting statistics that we were talking about earlier. So what does this mean specifically for founders and for SMBs? How do employers lead in a new paradigm to reimagine what is right for their organizations? Start with how to attract talent. 
With quit rates at staggeringly high numbers, it is an employee's market. And again, that might level the, field, uh, the playing field overall for startups. Uh, if you are able to be more nimble, if you are able to be more flexible, if you are able to meet employees where they're at quicker than a larger organization, that might bode well for you. The new world of work requires a different approach to attracting talent. What you can do to attract great talent, how can, how can you do that when there are so many options and people are so willing to move? So first things first, offer flexibility whenever possible. But we've seen from the research that employees want flexibility at the highest levels, at all levels of how they work. They want to be able to take their kids to school. They want to be able to be at the bus stop. Not rocket science, like of course, we as people would like to not miss our families' lives. They want to be able to work when they can as well. You will get the best talent when you provide that flexibility on a remote or a hybrid workplace. And look beyond traditional talent pools. Uh, the hybrid work environment opens talent pools in game-changing ways. Employers no longer have to source locally, but can go to where the candidates are themselves. So if you need the best talent, you can go there. You don't need to pick up and move. You don't need to put in a new office. You can just go find them. But word to the wise, before you do that, if those people aren't in the state that you're working in today, like please talk to someone who knows something about HR before you do that, but like that is a good idea to be able to attract talent. Also, get creative with incentives. The definition of work is being redefined. It's more about outcomes than hours worked. There are a lot of studies out there reinforcing the importance of employee health and well-being, and employers have to get creative about offering benefits, such as work-life balance programs, childcare, pet care, a lot of COVID puppies out there, tutoring, language courses, tuition reimbursement, or even a program to help employees pay, repay student loans. Other ideas are to offer full-time benefits, stay bonuses, so maybe diverting a little bit of your, your budget to keeping your employees instead of just always trying to attract them. Meal allowances as well. And, and you as founders, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, you can do this within the budget that makes sense for your organization. So as you're thinking about this, don't necessarily think I have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the budget to do this. Like this is scalable and this can happen from employee number one if you're intentional about it. You can compete, talk to someone. And so with two thirds of job seekers saying that a diverse workforce is important for evaluating job offers, Embedding DEI practices into your recruitment process is no longer just an option. It is a strategic imperative for everyone. Here are some tips to get you started. Establish a clear vision and measurable goals. So really famous quote, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up somewhere else. So if you want to do, be intentional, like we heard in some of the prior talks about DEI, at least figure out where you are today and where you'd like to be. That's the first step. Seek out diverse, divergent perspectives when evaluating and selecting candidates. Interview with an eye toward unconscious bias. Again, everyone only has one perspective. I have one point of view. So let's keep that in mind when we're talking to people that you, you might only see one perspective when you're evaluating a candidate. Provide training for the people that are actually interfacing with your candidates. Even if that is you, go seek some training if you've never done interviewing. That's, that's an easy tip that you can go onto Google to find today. Use inclusive language in job postings and online. So if you're, even if you just have a career page on your website today, because you might not have an applicant tracking system, be mindful of the wording that you're using. If you do have an applicant tracking system or something like that, consider using AI uh, to mask personal identifi identifier information on resumes. That's an easy thing to do through technology today as well. And also tell great stories about when DE&I has brought success in the organization or at least at other organizations in the community that you're looking to emulate. Like if, if you're trying to get there, let's, let's talk about how it's been successful. So again, this, this is just a framework. It's, it's about starting where you're at today. Let's move to our second truth. In this hybrid world, 
you no longer have the luxury of getting everyone together all the time. You can't just say, come into the office, or let's meet for happy hour, or something like that, especially on a budget or early on in your organization in your startup's life cycle. You actually have to get intentional to get to know them, to get to know your team and your employees, and create environments where they can succeed. Truth number two, culture always matters at every stage of business, but it matters now more than ever for everybody. Building a strong culture provides consistency and direction. What you prioritize with your money and your time, that's how you allocate resources. So if you have culture as something that's important to your organization, simple as put money, time, or attention toward it. That's how you can allocate resources even early on if you're just pre-revenue even. It guides decisions and actions. And as much as we would like to be everywhere, and I get this, I, I work on a team that is dispersed across, across three states. I would love to be everywhere at once. You can't. And we need to be comfortable with that. Our culture helps people decide where to go in tough spots at work. It fuels your workforce. Culture can be the fuel that sparks creativity and innovation within every organization. It contributes to driving engagement. You can't have engagement without having a strong culture first. That culture needs to drive your purpose and your vision. Why are you even in business in the first place? Ultimately, it helps a company reach its potential. Uh, rather than viewing culture as a secondary issue off to the side, founders and leaders should see culture as a driving performance factor. Culture also plays a vital role in cultivating belonging on your team and in your company. Fostering belonging in the workplace means that people of all backgrounds get a seat at the table and feel seen, heard, and recognized for their contributions at work. According to research from professional coaching company BetterUp, creating a sense of belonging at work can play a huge difference in employee wellness, productivity, performance, and retention leading to 50% less turnover risk. So again, there's a second lever you can already pull to reduce your turnover risk in a highly volatile employment market. To promote engagement, belonging, frontline managers and leaders at any stage of the organization need to relearn how to lead and manage in ways that promote belonging for all employees. Fostering the right culture isn't just good for employees, though. It is good for business. I think you're seeing that there is a trend. It's not just the right thing to do. It is also profitable. It goes hand in hand. You don't have to pick. According to Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, quote, company culture is often blamed for massive business failures and given credit for massive successes. They did a study after talking to 2,000 founders and executives to learn how their view of company culture, to, just to understand whether culture actually deserves all the credit and all the blame. It does. I'll, I'll save you the time. It does deserve both. Findings actually showed culture is the most important value driver at US firms. If you remember one thing today, remember that. Culture is the number one statistically proven value driver at US firms today. If you're going to differentiate outside of product, differentiate with culture, lead with that. As important as culture is to your business though, it can be challenging to start, it can be challenging to shift. According to a new study from the Institute for Corporate Productivity, I4CP, only 15% of respondents globally reported that their employer has achieved highly successful culture transformations. So if that many employees are saying this is, this is something that's important, and only 15% of, of employer, employers on an anonymous survey were willing, like they were saying, yeah, they did it right, there is an opportunity. And so you, especially as a startup founder, don't necessarily see this as I have less resources. You can see this as I can start from a good place that is a gap that you can monetize, and that's something you can do to win and to make progress. 
And despite that lack of success, the steps to effective culture transformation are still clear and attainable for most organizations. So where do you start? Here's one of those takeaways that you probably should remember. There's gonna be six actionable steps to create the kind of culture you want or to potentially change it. Start with why culture is so important to your organization. What do you want to do or create better? If you haven't, I would highly recommend on, on this step, pull up YouTube, go to Start With Why, it's a TED Talk, it's also a book. Um, I highly recommend that for anything in business. But again, just like that, we should start with the purpose. If you're gonna be a purpose-driven organization, you should probably have purpose behind the entire planning process, right? What gaps exist in your culture today? And how can you close them? Here's a really interesting question, and I do think it's a, a dichotomy. Do we want to prioritize inclusion, or do we want to grow at all costs? Because those are two polar opposites. So where are you going to land, and how does that fit into the culture that you want to develop? Another idea is codifying the behaviors that are important. Call them out. So on our team, my big three, attitude, effort, execution. Everyone on our team knows that. And so if you know that that is what is in, integral into the culture, you can hire for that, you can train for that, you can coach for that, and you can expect it. But again, that starts from the first conversation. And if you're going to be authentic about bringing those values to work, it has to be in everything. You don't get to just have it as something that you see as you walk up the steps or something that is a computer background. I'll get off my soapbox, I promise. Having the right language enforces aspirational elements essential to building or redefining your culture. It does. Organizations that fail to reinvigorate their culture do not take the time up front to clearly identify the behaviors and practices expected. Again, I'll say it again. If you don't know where you're going, you might end up somewhere else. So have a clear roadmap in the direction that you want to go in. Also, identify elements of the culture you want to include or keep, and what needs to be eliminated. An easy thing you can go back to work tomorrow, well, probably not tomorrow, Monday, uh, and do is a start, stop, continue with your team. And if you can't do it, you don't feel comfortable, find someone else to lead that exercise. It can be you in a whiteboard, it can be you on Zoom, and get their input about what they want to start or continue or stop. That's probably a pretty good place to start if you're trying to drive culture, ask. Not that hard, right? Ensure that the best, though, of what's existing from those norms, ensure that they're preserved. And that fundamental values in the history of how you got to where you are today, no matter how early you are in business, are part of the new culture. Ensure that you and any of your leaders, whether formal leaders or informal leaders, set positive examples of desired behaviors for your culture and your performance. This needs to be through their decisions, through their actions, through their words, through their behavior, all of it. And the importance of leader buy-in cannot be understated. Flush out any skeptics and non-believers. You don't want to go backwards, you want to go forwards. And I am going to admit it, vulnerable moment, this is hard. For example, we're all running a million miles an hour. If you want to prioritize work-life balance, you know the easiest program? You, as a leader, you as a founder, show what good work-life balance looks like and show that it's possible to achieve it without having your performance suffer. So it's easy. Log off at five most days. Say that you're with your family. Don't send emails after hours or before hours if you can avoid that. Take PTO yourself. Lead by example. That's, it starts at all levels. If you do it, you manage it successfully too. Also share success stories and share them often. Positivity definitely is more infectious. Uh, history shows that civilizations pass down their virtues and their norms and their rituals through storytelling. This is the same for your organization. Again, no matter how big or small, your startup can share these stories far and wide to ensure that the connections to your culture are clear. Why are you sharing this story? What is about this is important? Focus on the future. Your role as a leader is to drive your people toward your aspirational culture and not allow gravitational pull to pull you back. 
Remember that cultivating culture takes time. This is a commitment. It is not a one and done. This is not a 30-day process. This is not a PDF to download. It is people. It's culture. So yes, it is a major investment. But if anyone's ever spoken to me, you can think business boiled down and oversimplified has three things. It has an idea, good or service. It has money. You need that to be successful. And you need people. Without people, you do not have a business. So it's not odd to prioritize it at least as much as you'd prioritize the service or product or funding. This is hand in hand with creating an inspiring culture with our next truth. When it comes to attracting and retaining talent, people want to work for a purpose. Anyone want to do something meaninglessly? I don't. Many jobs and startups are intrinsically motivating. Uh, improving quality of life, contributing in some sort of way. And that's great. That's, that's the energy of Twin Cities Startup Week. But we also need to acknowledge the growing evidence that all employees want to feel a sense of purpose behind their work and knowing that what I'm doing today for their organization makes a difference. And it doesn't matter if it's the most basic level. What I do, my work matters. As McKinsey said, help your team find purpose or watch them leave. Those are your options. According to PwC, 83% of workers rank meaning as one of the three most important factors in their jobs. So if you think about other factors, probably being pay or location or something like that, meaning and purpose is top three when I'm considering what I'm doing. That's amazing. Let's use that as a, as a catalyst for growth. Employees expect their jobs to bring a significant sense of purpose to their lives. And creating strong links to an individual's purpose benefits individuals and employers and companies alike. In fact, people who find their purpose congruent with their jobs get more meaning from their roles, making them more productive and more likely to outperform their peers even within your organization. And I don't know about you, but if I'm running an organization, internally or externally, I would like to outperform the other folks that are in the space. So this is the goal. This is an actionable item. Prioritize it. Since individual purpose directly affects both health and motivation, employers need to help meet this need or prepare to lose talent to companies that will. This is especially important to millennials and to Gen Z. According to McKinsey's research on purpose, quote, millennials are even more purpose-driven than other generations in the workplace. And this is a trend that keeps growing for subsequent gen generations. So how do employers, how do founders help employee experience purpose at work, regardless of what it is they're doing? What people need from work and what drives them personally can be complex. People are complex. We're all a little bit different at minimum, right? Sometimes an individual's purpose aligns perfectly with organizational purpose, but other times it's only a partial match, and that's okay. Start by simply discussing the matters with your team openly. That's, that's where to start. Don't hide it. Let's talk about it. Do this thoughtfully, and by treating this as the beginning of an ongoing conversation, you can help them connect more powerfully to meaning and to purpose. There are three main areas where people find meaning and purpose. And so you can think of it from purpose from the organization. So does an individual connect to the work that they're doing, the mission, the values, the purpose of the organization? That's the first thing. The, the second thing would be purpose from the work they're doing within the organization, kind of sub, sub, substrated on the hierarchy there. And so people who find individual purpose congruent with their role tend to get more meaning, more productivity. And then the third is finding, of course, purpose outside of work. I don't know about you, but I don't work all of the time, so there's also that aspect of it too. Things like, I don't know, taking care of family, um, hobbies, things that make people not robots or numbers. So think about that. When someone's showing up to work, they're showing up with all of that. So you have the organization you work for, you have the job that they're doing, and you have everything else, and that shows up into purpose. Leaders and founders should find ways to reinforce organizational and individual purpose, one and three, in everything from hiring, feedback, incentives, 
and matching individuals to jobs that they will find fulfilling as much as possible. Which leads us to our fourth and final truth. Learning new skills is a powerful source of motivation. It's the job of leaders, managers, and founders to help employees learn, grow, and take time to get to that next level. And here's a compelling stat that reinforces that truth. In fact, 94% of employees say they would stay longer at a current company if they invested in their development. And this seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Like, if your current employer helps you get to some place that you aren't today, you don't need to leave to go there. So maybe we can invest some time or limited resources in that, which again will reinforce the bottom line. So what does that mean for startups or for other employers, especially when resources might be a little bit scarce? Uh, dedicated training and development fosters employee engagement. Engagement is critical to your company's financial uh, performance. If your employees don't care about the work they're doing, you're probably not gonna be doing it well. Fair enough to say. And as the business landscape comes increasingly competitive, what are some steps that you can take to help employees advance today? It's important to not only develop talent today, but what are the skills and competencies needed to retain from your competition in the future? So let's think a little bit further down the line. Upskilling or reskilling can help soften the blow of economic disruption and enable organizations to increase career opportunities. According to the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report, this is stunning, more than one billion people need to be reskilled or upskilled to meet the demands of the global economy by 2030. And I don't know about you, that means we have seven years left. And most people still haven't caught on to that fact, that the, the world might look a little bit different in seven years than it does today. Let's prepare for it. Maybe without having to go hire a bunch of new employees. Maybe you could just get people to stay here, which is the goal. How can you be sure that you won't be left behind? Even if you're a super innovative startup here today and you're excited and you're growing and you're gonna get funding, this is great. How can you make sure that that and all of everything you're doing with your employees is relevant in 2030? Hopefully it is, that's why you're here. Identify the jobs that need to be done today, absolutely, that's practical. But don't forget about tomorrow. Take, take some time to think about that. What skills will be needed for those jobs inside and outside of your organization, whether you do or do not do that task today? Analyze the skill gaps and just create a business case to decide whether or not those skill gaps should be filled today. Provide targeted adult training, like continuously learning, uh, and make it safe to make mistakes. At least it, you have to learn. And what I mean by this, if you, if you want a book to read about this, it's a great one, it's called Black Box Thinking. And the main thread of the book uh, pr compares and contrasts airline pilots to folks in the medical field and how they learn from mistakes and how mistakes happen less fa fatally, although you think that's kind of amazing, with airline pilots because they share those mistakes. Even when the worst happens, they pull out the black box, and without shame, they learn from it, instead of hiding from those mistakes. And simply provide feedback and support. Tell, tell your team what you're thinking. Be transparent. Good people will stay and will perform if they see a role for themselves that will move their career forward. But what about training in a dispersed environment? We're in one today, which is really interesting. Anyone joining us online is upskilling virtually, so congratulations, you're a step ahead. The goal, good news is, with technology advancements and intentionality, growth and development can happen anywhere. I, I'm an example of this. I got uh, my MBA, my PHR, and then this thing called a Human Capital Strategist Certificate all online without ever leaving my house. I've never been to where my MBA's campus is. All of these things are possible. And you as founders, you as, you as employers, or even as entrepreneurs can keep that in mind. As a result, there's really been a shift toward dynamic, self-directed, and continuous learning opportunities for employees. And allow people to opt in and choose their learning. Uh, here are some ideas on the screen. 
uh, one of the things, as, as you're taking a look at that, I wanted to call out that doesn't take any money. You can implement this today. It's something that we do on our team. It's called office hours. So again, I man mentioned we have a team that's dispersed, I guess technically I was wrong, over four states, although one's only by a couple miles. And so what we do, uh, three times a week, we have one hour, and we, we get on Teams, get on Zoom, and I'm going to be there, right? I'm not taking attendance, and if you want to talk, uh, you can. You can come and talk about anything. And if no one shows up, that's okay. I'm just going to get some emails done. I'm going to get some admin done. But what ends up happening is people come, and those are times that no matter what, they can talk to me. And when you think about that, people show up. They might not be on camera. They might be on mute the entire time, just listening. But those are usually when we come up with our best ideas as a team, and that's when group learning that you can opt into continuous learning happens. So that even for me as leader, I'm not having to do the same thing 10 times. There's practical applications to this. And again, that costs no money to do that. That's something you can do at your startup today. Be available. In, in just a moment, we'll wrap with a Q&A. Uh, time does allow. But first, let's recap some takeaways. Get creative about operating in a remote or hybrid model. Get to know your people and what's important to them. Be a person. Great quote to remember on this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So empower employee success. Help people find meaning and fulfillment in their work. Provide the leadership, the resources, and the tools people need to win. Challenging times allow us to innovate and to recognize opportunities. Experimentation, pivoting, and then reiterating your way to success will guide us and give us the tools needed to make our organizations more profitable, more sustainable, and more attractive places to work, which is generally the whole idea of what we're doing here at Twin City Startup Week. So again, I, what I hope that you take away is that these are actionable items. What I hope that you take away is that, yes, there are some things in here that could cost money in, in our monetary investments, but there's so much that doesn't. And even the, the things that do cost money, they don't have to be on a multi-million dollar budget. If you start with intentionality, if you have a framework that you want to build on to get from point A to point B or to point Z, which you would do with a product roadmap at a startup, it should be maybe considered to do that with a people roadmap. And that doesn't mean that you need to hire a head of HR on day one. Would that be helpful? Absolutely. There are ways to go about that. There are resources everywhere, and there are people in the community that can help you. So with that, We'll turn it over to any questions you might have, in person or online. This is always the fun part, isn't it? You talked about performance reviews and tracking things of that nature. Sure. How does, how does one go about that? It, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So what was asked, just in case you can't hear, was uh, talking about performance reviews and tracking that, and, and how do you make sure that that's a data point that's worth your time and something that you can see over, over time. Did I get that right? Cool. So um, there are a lot of software solutions out there that can help with that. And when you get to a point in your organization that you can afford something like that, I highly recommend doing it. And um, I will get to. The, the non-monetary answer on that, I promise. Uh, the reason behind that is when you think about employee engagement, when you think about performance reviews, there is, a, there, there is a development aspect of that. There's also a compliance aspect of that. Just like we were saying earlier, uh, if, you're, if you're going to be promoting people, if you're going to be promoting a culture of DEI, or you also have people who might not be up to the task that they have today, documentation is really important. Um, so, so that's something I would highly encourage. Now, that could be as, as basic as keeping some sort of very private, locked, maybe password protected uh, records as a founder or as, as a people leader. And, and also what you could do is just start with an ongoing uh, Google Doc or something like that with an employee. If, if that's what you have and, and you can just give and take on feedback, the, the biggest thing to do that I can recommend for you is uh, 
making sure to have something where it can iterate and it can be a conversation. It can be a tool that it extends the, conversa the conversation outside of maybe those in-person or virtual one-on-ones. So maybe the whole idea behind it being if, when you're not, when you can't be everywhere at all times, how can you maybe kind of be? And that would be one way. Great question. Yes? Totally fine. But uh, a lot of the advice is great for startups who have hired early employees. Yeah. Are there any takeaways that you should be listening that we should be listening for for a solo entrepreneur member of the person you're trying to wear with sort of equal partners? Is there enough new employees and just people trying to make different cultures that norms? Yeah, so I'll reiterate the, the question just to make sure everyone can hear. So the 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 point was, hey, this is great for startups or for any organization who's hired. What about organizations that haven't? Maybe there is uh, one person or two founders, something like that, a group of founders, and how can we be intentional about creating culture? Making sure I get that right? Cool. Um, I think just starting with the roadmap of where you want to be and what you want to be known for, because like we were talking on the, the session before this, imposter syndrome's real. If, if you have an employer identification number, you are a, a business and you can create culture and that business entity isn't you. Like uh, the employer identification number is not my social security number, it is a different entity even if it's just me. And so what I want to be known for personally might be when we we're talking hierarchies, it might be underneath nested in that hierarchy of organization, job, individual, but that does definitely fit into it because I am driving the organization as well uh, and what kind of work. So it could be even something as simple as uh, creating a roadmap and agreeing to that with your co-founder. That would be the first thing. Second thing uh, you, could, you could do is like culture would be how you, in this sense, how you invest the limited resources you have. The most valuable thing you have right now is time. So it could even be something as simple as what you choose to spend your time on, how much time you spend on it, what you might outsource or not, what's important to you that you are going to put your attention into it. Uh, and start there, because you, you, if you have a team of two and it's two co-founders or something like that, you definitely still have a team and you should definitely lean on each other. I, I hope that's a little helpful. Cool, right here. Yeah. That's a good point. So the, the point was if you're a solopreneur or you're a team of two and you're introverts, maybe if you are going to hire, hire an extrovert or two to get started. That might be helpful. Fostering communication, that's a great point. Anything else out there? Well, I will say my contact information didn't make it up there. It's probably my bad because I should have typed it. Uh, so I, I will be around after this, this meeting, but for anyone who might be viewing this as a recording, it's just my first and last name, so casey.divine at trinet.com. Uh, and again, we're running around uh, the Twin Cities all the time. We'll be here uh, for startup awards and everything like that. So if you, you want to have a conversation or you're just a little bit curious about building a team or human resources or people, uh, or a little bit of the psychology and stats we got into today. I would love to chat with you guys about that. Thank you.